see everybody today. I, I've done this one before, um, but this is going to be a little bit different. Um, so today we're going to talk about the, the process in the College of Education. And if you have questions, just feel free to interrupt and ask. Um, I'm happy to answer any type of questions. What I thought I'd try and do today is um, look at external reviewers, the process, the importance of following um, the process, the instructions and where you can find more information and who not to contact and who you can contact, um, who doesn't have the ability to actually provide any additional assistance and who might be able to, and then show you how it's done and address any types of questions that you might have. So one of the questions would be where you are in the process. So if you're in tenure and promotion and you've, been, you've received the notice from the, the college or the university that you should be going up um, for tenure and promotion, that's one, one aspect. If you're a person that's considering going up for promotion, um, that's another. And you have to keep these dates in mind. Your, your notice of intent to your department chair for going up really has to be um, provided by April 1st. So there is kind of this deadline date. In terms of going up for promotion, one of the things to consider is there's this unwritten 10 year rule. And nowhere in the faculty handbook does it say 10 years. However, I can tell you that in talking with the provost, um, and I can tell you that people that haven't had been in academia for 10 years, um, have been able to get promoted to full in a lesser period of time, but you want to have a really strong CV because the provost is going to look at those closer. So um, April 1st would be the date to declare that intent. May 1st would be the date that you would have a list of all your external reviewers to your department chair. And then really between May and August is when you have to do all the uploading. And one of the reasons I'm doing this so early is to give you a chance to get an idea of how you can start preparing for, for this process now just using ShareDrive. And we can talk a little bit about your narratives as well. It just depends upon where we are with the, with the time. In the slide, and I'm going to be recording this, I can send you this and I can send you links to additional information. Um, these are the instructions for the dean's office. And if you look at it, you can see there are times where the dean's office is opening up a share drive file for you and closing it, and then reopening it for your department chair for uploading of external letters, then it closes it, then it goes to the department committee, then it gets closed, then it goes to the department chair, it's opened up, gets closed, then it goes to the College of Education Committee, it gets opened up, they do their work and it gets closed. And this is kind of the process. And it's something that a lot of people normally don't see. I don't have the full calendar for the upcoming year, so I haven't provided that. Um, but this gives you an idea of where these things happen. The, the creation of that file for you in ShareDrive is going to be created by Amy Wilson. She knows how to create the share drive file. She has no other information to provide. If you have a question about what's going on, if something's not working right as you're trying to upload or provide that information, um, just contact me and I'll help direct you to the correct person. If you email Amy, what she will do is she'll email me, Dr. Zanskis. Dr. Brassfield needs, has a question or you know, Dr. Gulasino has a question and then I end up answering it anyway. So. Um, just contact me and I'd be happy to help you. So external reviewers, and really the responsibilities here are split up between faculty, the department chair, the external reviewer, and then your TNP committees. But a lot of this um, does fall on you. And I wanna talk a little bit about external reviewers. So you wanna select a list of external reviewers. This is your responsibility and not more than one can be a past mentor or a collaborator. And I know that there's a new faculty handbook that's, I don't know, if, have they adopted that one yet, Patrick? No, it's just out there. So that's under the 2019 guidelines, it's still no more than one can be a past mentor or a collaborator. You wanna choose as many people as you can and select as many people as you can. It is getting very difficult to get people to actually submit external review letters. 
You also want to put down, if you know there's somebody that in, in your field, for example, if there's somebody who is politically or diametrically opposed to your viewpoints, you might want to also include, do not include this person on the list because you don't want to have somebody included inadvertently um, that is going to write a really negative letter. And that, that's a whole other process. So you submit this list to the department chair. Those have to be to your department chair by May 1st. And you select your materials that are going to be sent to that external reviewer. So they aren't going to get usually a copy of your CV. They'll get a copy of your narratives, your teaching, research, and service narratives. They're also going to get, you should provide three or four of your best um, your best work, your written work, as something as an exemplar work of what you do. This is really not the time to be modest. You can be modest any other time, but when you're going up for tenure or promotion, you really want to, you know, emphasize your strengths and emphasize why you're you're making the argument and making the case to people who may not know your discipline why you should um, be receiving tenure and why you should, or why you should be promoted. Uh, Steve, I have a question. Yes. Okay, so how many people in the list will, will you consider um, from, you know, um, from my, if I have 20, how many people will you consider and what will you consider outside of my list? So the department chair considers it. I don't get to consider anything. So the okay. department chair makes this decision. They are required to accept at least one of your suggestions. Mm -hmm. And I'll talk a little bit more about that, but they are only required to take one. They may accept more and many times do, but they're only required to accept one. Uh -huh. So when you're looking at that reviewer, you really want to look at the quality, how of that reviewer is their work closely aligned with yours, your area of research, because that makes a difference in terms of um, their ability to evaluate your work. We're now a tier one, and that's a this is a difficult issue right now because now we've just transitioned from this aspirant tier one, mm -hmm. but we were still a tier two institution. So mm -hmm. now suddenly, here you're coming up, and now it's tier one. So you want to look at that, you know, the prestige, or at least in, I would say like a peer or equivalent institution, or higher. So it's harder to be higher than a tier one at this point, but from where we were, that's how you're going to make that decision. So, so, and, so Steve, uh, another yes. question. So if if um, the, the chair chooses um, candidates or review, external reviewers outside of my list, will they consider this criteria as well? Yes. Okay. And they will be choosing. So the, actually your department committee can make recommendations. It does not happen very often in my experience that the departmental committee makes a um, recommendation for external reviewers, but it is your department chair's responsibility to um, also have external reviewers. And they provide, they provide a list. And there's actually, there's a kind of like a template and it's a Word document. I can send you the Word document that says, good. here are the qualifications of what the external reviewer is. And I, it's there as a link, but it doesn't actually open up as a link. It just goes directly to the document. So it's easier for me to send you a copy of the document. So you have an idea of what they would look at. I can also send you a copy of what they would send as a letter to the external reviewer. Um, so the other part you want to make is a decision about is you want somebody at least at your rank or higher. Um, you don't, so if you're going from assistant to associate, you want an associate usually, or a full um, deans, department chairs, center directors, any of them can be all impactful, but you want to consider those criteria because again, you want people to, that are going to hopefully write a good positive letter about your work and why you should get tenure and promotion. So it is kind of a high stakes issue. In Dr. terms Nancy. Yes. Sorry. Oh, that's uh, okay. Does the university um, maintain a list of institutions it considers to be peers? No, they do not. Okay. So the, they would have, you know, so at peer, a peer institution, when we were tier two, 
I would have looked at places I, I use, I didn't use, I didn't look at that. I actually, when I did mine, I looked at um, just people. Rehab counseling is a relatively small profession. Rehab counselor educators, there might be 300 at this point. There's not a lot of choices. So I just picked out, you know, people from um, universities that had higher status, at least as high status as the University of Memphis, you know, um, or an urban institution potentially, or um, a tier one Carnegie One Intense Research Institute. And those were the, the places that I chose. Um, but we don't necessarily have a list of comparables that I'm aware of. Um, I know that I've had to use something like that when I was developing uh, the PhD program in counselor ed and supervision in order to provide the Tennessee Higher Education Commission um, market survey that showed that this group was at this university was a peer of ours so we could make an adequate comparison. But I don't know if we specifically have it. So I would look at people in your profession, in your area, in your focus area that you feel might um, might give you a good reference. And the way you find them a lot of times is through networking or talking with your mentor about who might make a good peer reviewer. And I have here four to eight, I might give 10 because I've seen people that so often now people don't take want to take the time or they don't have the time or people that were doing that now are retiring. It's just, you know, or they say they're going to and then they don't. And then all of a sudden they have to go to the next person on the list because somebody that promised that review never did. And there's no compensation. So nobody gets paid for doing it. It's a service and it's considered a service. Uh, Steve, I have a yes. question. Okay, yes, so I'm, I'm going for promotion and I actually forgot my external reviewers, uh, you know, the last time. Uh -huh. Well, um, is it, um, I mean, just, for, just to check, Will um will you guys see the the names of the of my previous external reviewers so that there's no, you know I mean so that it's fair or it's it's transparent? I forgot the, the names. I totally forgot the names of my reviewers. The, the last dean's year. office doesn't see them until they come in as external review letters. Okay. Okay. Um, and they're they're uploaded into that that committee. Otherwise, they are actually seen. Uh huh. Um, okay. Now. So here's the other thing, and one of the reasons I'm doing this in February, if you haven't already in your process of going through this, if you're using OneDrive, and if you went up in the past before one, you know, before using UM Drive, none of that information exists. And once these um, OneDrive file folders are closed to you, they're closed to you forever, and you never have access to them again. So you really want to, what I would do is I would start structuring my, my electronic dossier in my own personal share drive so that I could make those transfers easily. Um, and it will go much faster. And it also gives you a chance of retaining that information. So we don't have access. Now, the only person that might have access, and I'll get to that in a second, would be Sheila Mathis. The College of Education retains absolutely no information. We have no personnel information about you. We have absolutely nothing. All that is maintained by, um, by the university in HR, now by Sheila Mathis. Uh, and she's very helpful. So if you have a question about something, she can potentially locate that information. But if you ask Amy Wilson or if you contact me, do you have a copy of this? I can honestly say, no, we would not. That's just not retained in our office. So what I'm encouraging you to do is encourage, I really want you to consider those selections carefully. So for example, in rehab counseling, there is a big difference between people that believe themselves to be counselors first and people that consider themselves to be rehab specialists first. At times, there's a lot of polarization and um, a lot of political disagreement. So I wouldn't really want to be evaluated by somebody that didn't consider themselves a counselor first because they're not going to appreciate my perspective. Um, and so consider the names carefully and people that have high status. So sometimes we've worked as a, 
a journal reviewer. So the editor for that journal um, that I'm reviewing, they may be a potential source of um, an external reviewer. So no, no real close collaborations, I guess. Here's the department's chair's responsibility. And I'm only talking about this so you have an idea that they have a big role in this is they have to, to accept at least one of your suggestions. They develop their own list of external reviewers. They start contacting them around May and soliciting and trying to make sure that those letters are coming in. And if you don't get them, if they don't start coming in, and if you've ever, I've been an external reviewer, and if I didn't have mine done in June, then I'll start getting emails about when's my external review letter going to be done, which might be one of the reasons people, if they know they aren't due until August, um, they're not going to work in, on them in June. And maybe one of the reasons that people decide um, I don't want to be a, an external reviewer any longer. So they do that and they have to obtain those letters. They have to follow up and they actually upload those letters into your electronic dossier. Um, you don't do that. So you, you aren't contacting, you might contact somebody informally to ask if they'd be willing to do that or be listed as an external reviewer. I have had that happen. I've agreed to do it. Sometimes I've been chosen as an external reviewer. Sometimes I haven't. I, I can think of one case where somebody had an, had a negative review and they said, why did you write a negative review? Well, they con he contacted me to find out if I would serve as an external reviewer, but I was never contacted to do a review. So I wasn't one of the people that was on that selected list. So somebody else wrote letters that weren't um, supportive of that person's getting tenure. So consider those kinds of things. And they are supposed to have at least four letters in your um, dossier that are submitted. And if not, they're responsible for writing a paragraph about why they haven't actually been able to obtain um, the reviewers or explain the process that they went through in order to find an external reviewer. This is what the external reviewer is going to look at. They're going to answer that one basic question. How do you assess the quality of the scholarly and or creative activity of the candidate? And they're going to look at your CV, your publications, and your personal narrative. So you really want to pick your best publications you know, um, that you feel. And I don't know if it's, if it's useful if you think, well, maybe I'll pick one that's very early on in the middle and progression. And here's my latest. I would pick your best. I wouldn't necessarily look for a chronological um, that chronological kind of ordering of them. I would look for the, the what I felt were the best or in the highest, um, highest status journals in your profession. And then they write this single spaced detailed evaluative letter. They go on for several pages. Um, and they talk about your published work, your research agenda, your stature in the field and the potential for future impact. So when you're going up from assistant to associate, they're looking at um, they're looking actually at your potential for growth in the field and projection about where they feel, you know, is it just going to stop or are you making excellent progress or you're just this dynamic person that's going to um, be doing more, bigger and better, great things uh, as time goes on. That's the kind of thing that they're going to be addressing in those letters. Um, and the chair will review them, the committee will review them, the two committees, the departmental committee and then your college committee will review them as it goes through this whole process. So they do carry weight because they're external, but I think the university is beginning to recognize there is um, much, it's much more difficult to obtain them than it had been in the past. Dr. Zanskis? Yes. For our um, publications, is it best to pick just ones that we were first on? I would, I would, to the extent I could, I would pick ones that I was first, unless I was okay. second author. You know, if there was a national, for example, there was a national person that has the, the outstanding reputation in school counseling, the absolute premier person in that field, and you're second author, then I would use the second author. Okay. But if, I, if you're first author, I would use those. First or second author, I would avoid, if you include 
um, even if it's on your CV, they'll, they're going to look at your CV and look at how many first authorships and people actually, they just physically count them. Um, you know, first, second, third author, if it's a book chapter, if it's a book review, they look at all of that in, depending upon the department that you're in, peer reviewed manuscripts have higher, um, status, even though they may never actually be read, they're going to be considered of higher status. And that's just part of how it is in, the, in academia. Um, somebody may read far more in other sources, but that's going to be considered highest. So, uh, yeah. Steve, uh, would it help? Uh, I have a question. Would it help uh -huh. to um, to add the this the number of citations in Google Scholar or your your you know your your credibility as a scholar by looking at the the publications, the journals, if they're top or not? Yeah, I would also so you can look at that and you can include that in your. Um, you can include that. Not all departments in, look at your department's handbook. They are all redone in about 2018 or 2019. And look at how they wrote their handbook at that time and how they're evaluating you at, at that time. So a different department may not look at that as closely and another might in um, the college. And so what happens is you do, you provide all your information and then you know, the external letters go in, your departmental committee reviews your work, the department chair reviews your work, the college committee reviews your work. And at each stage, somebody's making a recommendation. Then it goes to the dean. The dean makes a complete and separate review of all of your work. It's a comprehensive review. She makes a recommendation to the provost. The provost then makes the decision or, or recommendation to the president of the university. And so there are all these different stages. And a lot of times at the college or at the departmental level, it can be a, a narrower focus based upon the department. And when you get to the, the provost level, those they're looking at it in a more global sense than the individual department. So anything that you can do that will convey the impact of your work that can be helpful. You know, some of the impact factors are really not intended to rate. Um, they're like a library ranking. So they're more really related to the ranking of the library than your specific work. But um, you can include those things and people review them. You know, it's, you're, you're trying to make your best case for why you should have tenure and why you should have promotion. Mm -hmm. If you get to the point where you're looking at stop the clock, and that has happened, especially because of COVID, a lot of research has really been impacted. You have to make a, you write a letter, basically, letter or an email to your department chair, and the department chair then has to form a recommendation, and then they forward that to the dean, or the dean and to me. Um, and then there'll be a recommendation made that the dean's office will make to uh, Provost Neenan or the provost, at whoever the provost is at the time, Provost Neenan today, um, they make the recommendation that's actually the provost decision. So it can be something that you'd want to start early, but you have to have a, a rationale for that. A lot of times it's medical, but with uh, the pandemic, that could also be something that's dramatically influenced your ability to research. For example, researching in a school might be more difficult when, when school is being held remotely and students aren't available. And so those kinds of things, um, health issues, the, whatever that stressor was, or the combination of stressors will be useful in, in doing that in the stop the clock argument. So the T and P committees, they're just actually going to review, consider, and they weigh the evidence. So that's where it gets into, um, your narrative is being, you know, it doesn't have to be, I mean, it's usually several pages. And by several, I don't mean 10. Um, they're usually several pages, more than two, three, three pages reading. And that's where you're able to make your case about your research, about your scholarship, about your teaching and your service. So they're going to look at all that. They weigh it and then they make a, a recommendation. All this actually goes on after they review it, there's a recording of the vote, not who voted what, but the number of people that vote for, in favor, against, or abstain. Um, 
And then the search committee, uh, not the search committee, the departmental committee signs that and that gets uploaded. And then that same document gets downloaded. Mm -hmm. And then the chair does the same thing. And he or she would write their comments on and upload it. And then it goes to the college committee. And so they're all signing off on the same document. So each successive layer is always looking at what the prior group said, and they have access to all the information, usually for a limited period of time of about two weeks. It's not much longer than that. So in your electronic dossier, a lot of this information can be found here in this link, and it's really at Ac Office of the Provost and Academic Affairs under instructions. We also have links on the College of Education faculty resources. And then if you have any questions about locating a document, like your, I don't know, I think I, I made, I foolishly thought that when they went to UM Drive, I would always have access to my old information. And that wasn't the case. So I had to actually recover everything when I was going up for promotion to full. And in order to do that, I had to contact Sheila Mathis for certain documents that I no longer had or couldn't find. And she was able to locate them again. She's the person that would have those. So you want to contact them. The, the tenure and promotion dossier guidelines and instructions, I don't know if it'll pop up if I hit that. It's not. Um, I will send you the link to that. And it kind of goes through that in a real specific way, but I'm going to cover some of that right now so you have a better idea of how to do it. And I really would recommend creating a separate file for yourself now. If you haven't already in the past, create one now. Again, you will never have access to the information that you submit again. So if you're going from assistant to associate and you want to have access to that information when you go up for full, you'll want to have a record of it and you won't have it if you just use the shared drive that's provided by the Dean's office for this process. The provost office eventually, we transfer that file to the provost office and our file is gone. Mm. So again, this is a thing of shared responsibilities. Um, it's the bulk of it actually falls on you as a faculty member. The dean's office has a fairly small responsibility, but it's an important one, and, and then the department. These are all the different things that you have to include. And when you look at the instructions for from the provost's office and how to set up your file, it doesn't have that preceding zero, but unless you do that, it will all go out of order. Um, so you need to add the, the zero. So instead of just being 1.2 in the instructions, you have to put down zero 1.2. If you create a folder for documents, like you're providing copies of all your, everything that you've um, published or a copy of you know, your letter or your email or a program acceptance that you presented at a conference, all those things would go in a file. That might be where you'd use a file folder, but for the majority of these things, you're really just going to want to label them um, 0, 1.2 appointment history form and just upload that one document there. If there are large groups of information, then you would want to put them in a folder. And the folder will show up out of order. The folder will come before all those individual documents. So these are things that you would have to include, like the appointment history form. And there's, again, a, a Word document link at the provost's office for that appointment history form. If you have an early tenure memo or stock the clock memo, that's where you would include that. And so you, you would list it as 01.3 early tenure memo or stock the clock, stop the clock memo, excuse me. And you just kind of keep including those things, the initial appointment letter. That was one document that I had a hard time finding from when I first started as a, an assistant professor. Sheila Mass Mathis would have that. Your annual evaluations are also, you may not have copies of all of those depending upon the chair or who was the chair. Sheila Mathis can probably help you recover that information and provide that to you. So she's really nice and she's really helpful. You would just want to give her time enough to do that because she's, she's like a lot of our staff that are um, overworked and their offices are not staffed adequately. 
You'd want to include your midterm tenure evaluation statement. Now that you're going up for an associate or even as a full, I would still include it. Your, your, your narrative about your teaching responsibility and philosophy, your seat summary sheets, and you want to include all of the comments from your seats as well. So the, the qualitative comments, and you can copy those off and you, you could put, you could, that would, could be a file where you enclose all those seat summary sheets and the, the comments. ICL might have peer evaluations of teaching and are really um, not very typical in leadership or in CEPR, but if you have those, include them. If you don't, don't worry about it. You don't have to include that if it's an area you don't have. Teaching honors and awards, those would be if you received any honors or awards for teaching, either the, the college teaching or like the Crater Award, which kind of cuts across teaching research and service or any external award for teaching. The WTCA, you know, West Tennessee Counseling Association Teaching Award, you know, that could go in there too. So that's, they're divided by these sections. So six is going to be teaching, seven is going to be research. And you'll see there's a spot for research philosophy. That's your narrative. Internal grants and contracts, those are things that you've obtained through the University of Memphis. External is anything outside of the University of Memphis. And you do not, you don't include like all the grant award notifications or the contracts. You just include the date, the award number, and it's a simple list for things like this. Um, if you want to include that elsewhere, that would be in a different file folder. Um, but here it's just a list. So it's a Word document or a PDF list. But again, any peer evaluations of your research or your scholarship, or if you had any honors or awards, you would list it like that. And then you would just put 0 0.75 honor and award and include that there. And all you're doing is providing evidence that these things are actually true. They're all on your CV, but this is just providing supplemental evidence to prove that it's actually accurate. Service, it's the same thing. You have this brief summary, your narrative that you provide about your service, your philosophy, what, what you have done. That's that first section. Then you go to internal grants and contracts for service. So what I'm getting at is they break grants for research as separately as grants for service. For example, my research, my rehabilitation service administration grant, and Patrick, that grant is actually considered a service grant. We could do research from it, but if we put it under here, under this section, the, the Memphis Integrative Behavioral Health and Training Initiative, that's actually a service grant but research has been done from it. So, but it wasn't the primary intent. So that's an external grant that's done for service as opposed to a specific research grant like through National Institute of Health or SAMHSA um, or NSF, for example. Or what, about, what about unfunded grants, Steve? Unfunded grants? Yeah, like Spencer, Russell, Sage. Those are all external. Oh, okay. You would list those external, under. Yeah, uh, under, okay. And you just, it's again, simple list. Don't do anything more than a simple list. Mm -hmm. All those things, um, if you're going to provide a copy of them, you could provide them all in that section 10.2, which is supplemental materials. Um, and it's the same, same process. Um, honors and awards that you've received for service any peer evaluation of service or your advising or mentoring. Um, one of the things that the college is looking at doing is creating a mentoring award this year to go along with teaching as an award um, or the university has a mentoring award or if you had one from an external organization, you could include that. The university curriculum is the university CV system that we all have to use. It, all you do is you make a PDF of your CV. So if it's not current and if it's not, you know, we're all working on faculty evaluations. If you're working on those, it should be more current than you just make a PDF and you call that 09.0 .0 university curriculum and prepare that in a file. 
10.1 is the list of everything that you're going to include as a whole document in those supplemental materials. And that's normally 10.2 is where I put all of my manuscripts. Any program that showed that I actually had a presentation or an email that has that, depending upon how that's all done. Um, just something to provide proof. What you wanna do is you wanna make this as easy as possible for your reviewers because they're all really busy. They're all doing something. This is an addition. Some will read through everything. Some just might pick and choose what they read through. So you wanna make it as easy as possible. If you don't put things in the correct order, um, it is possible that um, somebody will contact me and ask how I can even review the document because it's not there. And I've had to search for the documents to show people where they were um, when they've made a submission because they didn't follow this order. So really follow the instructions closely. If you have a question at any time, just ask me. I'm more than happy to help. Um, everybody, I wanna see everybody that's here get tenure and promotion. So, I mean, that's, that's kind of the, the goal. The Dean's office just does two things. You know, they have the statement from the Dean and that the Dean writes that. I don't write that, Dean Hill Clark writes that. And then the statement from the college and school committee. And that's just the, that form. Um, this isn't anything that you upload, that's all done by Dean Hill Clark. The department has to start off that signature page that's used for all the different groups. Your department chair um, does their statement. Your department chair is actually supposed to sit down with you and review the letter with you that they provide. And technically, and usually the committee is actually supposed to do that too. To the extent they don't, they disagree with what they said, then that would be an argument that you were not provided due process in this process. So you always wanna keep that in mind as well. Um, the department uploads your external review letters. They upload the summary of credentials. They upload their copy of what they sent out to the external evaluator. All of those things are uploaded by the department chair. And you really wanna make it as easy as possible. And if you go to share drive and see if my link's gonna work, I may have to stop sharing and go back to share screen. That's not the screen I was trying to show you. Hold on, I'm gonna stop it again. I don't know why it's not stopping. I will have to come back. I'm not sure why that's going on. Yeah, Anna asked why if you would include somebody that was, um, should be excluded. I would provide a reason. I would just provide a you know difference difference of opinion. I wouldn't be really specific, but I would provide some detail about why. Um, why I felt they shouldn't be included. Okay. Hold on. I was doing good until I was trying to get to the link. So that link isn't working. And I don't have a good explanation for why. but I'll provide an additional link and I'll provide all that information and I can send this to you so you have it. Do you have questions at all? Any other questions? It can be, what you never really know is in the committees, you know, how, what people do and what they say when they're behind closed doors may be different than how they interact with you as an individual. So you don't really know that, um, but everybody here is very collegial. I already know. Um, so you might want to, it's a stressful time. It's stressful to accumulate it. It's stressful to collect it all. It's st stressful to add it all um, in. 
It just is very, from my own experience, I have found that it was, even though I didn't think it was going to be, it was more stressful than I expected. Uh, there are some resources in terms of the College of Education faculty resources. I'll try this, maybe that would work. Can you see, the, can you see this instructions? No. Can you see it now? Okay. So here, finally, that's because I have my um, internet, I had it way down. But here's some instructions. I will send you all the links for that. Um, it is, it's not a complicated process. It is a tedious process to collect all the information and upload all the information. It is not, not a, a simple, trying to locate it is not simple. In the past, when we had three ring binders, in some ways it was much easier. So if you're going to go up, and if you haven't been notified that you're going up for tenure and promotion, midterm tenure review is already, that process is already in place. This is going up for assistant or from assistant to associate or going up from associate to full. So it's a, a slightly different, different process. There's a little bit more to include when you're going for tenure or tenure and promotion than you are in that mid-tenure review process. If you're in the mid-tenure review process and you've received your feedback from the committee, what they'll look at is how you followed the feedback that you received at that time and what progress you've made since that time between now, that time and the time that you're going up for tenure or for promotion, tenure and promotion. So it's how you responded to those comments and whether or not you heeded what they recommended that actually becomes more important. Uh, so any questions at all about anything? People have done it. People have got tenure. People have gotten promotion. So it does happen. Um, it, it's just a, if you haven't kept really good track of your information and you have to try and gather it all, it's better to start now. And if you know that in February, it's a lot better than starting in May and having to go when you go off contract and all of a sudden you're spending your time working on your electronic dossier for uploading. The exact date isn't really clear, but it usually has to be done at some point in mid to late August where everything is uploaded. And then after that, you won't see that information again. Um, so I, I think that that's the really important part for me to avoid that, ex that additional work. Any questions about anything? How does TMP work for professors on clinical track? So on clinical track, it's not tenure, but it's promotion. So if you're on a clinical track, you can apply for a promotion, um, which doesn't give you tenure, but it is um, an advancement in rank and an advancement in pay. So it's the basic same process. Although if you're a clinical professor, you may not have a research component because that's not you're, that's generally not what's included in research, but you can include it. You're going to focus on the areas that are included for um, clinical work. If you're a research professor, for example, if you were in CREP, you don't have a teaching responsibility. Well, you're, you can't really talk about your teaching philosophy then, but you can talk about your research. And so the bulk of your um, content goes into that research statement. So you're evaluated a little bit differently but you have to be very clear that you're going on um, clinical track. So you can at least get promoted and you can move in rank and have an advancement in pay as a clinical professor, as opposed to being a person that's a visiting or a lecturer. Any other questions? Steve, is there ever a situation where, um, I think you briefly talked about this, where if nobody that you've put up um, as an external reviewer ends up agreeing to do so when the chairs reach out or things like that? Like, is there some sort of, I don't know, delay or fail safe or something that happens in, in those kind of weird situations? In those kinds of weird situations, 
then the dean's office tries to assist in looking for people. So I've had to identify people that could serve um, as external reviewers um, in the past. And I know the dean has contacted people um, to ask if they would be an external reviewer for um, faculty. So we've also become involved. Um, so there, there is that. Um, to the extent that you develop a big enough list and, you know, so for counselor ed, clinical mental health, that might be maybe easier. I don't know if it's mm -hmm. easier. Yeah. Rehab counseling was smaller um, and everybody kind of knows each other. So that's the other part. So you, you know, the, the factions that exist and some of the politics that are there, but yeah, the, the Dean's office has stepped in to provide names of, and actually I've contacted people and I know the Dean, the dean has as well and ask them if they would provide a letter. Um, yeah. And that's, that has worked. So um, we may not end up with the three or four, it's the department chair's responsibility to explain why. And it could be that, you know, a person retired, um, mm -hmm. they have too much work, that, yeah. whatever the issue is, they have to write a paragraph about that because they're just trying to explain to the committee why that information isn't there. Provost office recognizes that it's become more difficult. Okay. I have I have a follow up question uh, to piggyback on Patrick's question about external reviewers. Mm -hmm. um, so, to give more information um, on my list of why I put together, you know, the list of external reviewers, it, would it help the chair to uh, to write a, a blurb or something, a description uh, as to why I included? those external reviewers on my list? So different the significance have, of their work. Yeah, and different people have different perspectives on that. Um, but I have seen that. And there's the document that they use that they're supposed to, and I'll see if I can find it and see if I can pull it up for you in terms of here's the kind of thing that they're gonna look at. Mm -hmm. There's a letter that goes, hold on a second while I'm looking, that goes to the external reviewer list. And I'll see if I can open that. And if it opens, okay, I'll go to this and try and share it. So you can see, see the document that I'm talking about. Can you see that? Wow. I'm, I'm happy about it. It actually worked. So you can see here's the thing that actually the chair has to provide in their information. And so in some areas, people might provide similar information. So you can say, here are the names. You don't have to do this, but it provides some brief information about the person that's doing the evaluation. And this is available on the provost page and I can provide that. Um, but I'd also put down, and you don't have to go into great detail about why you wouldn't want somebody as a reviewer. You can just say, um, you know, please exclude this person, this person, or this person that um, from consideration as an external reviewer. But you can see there's just basically that paragraph that you're talking about, Sharice, in a really short, Here's what they are. Here's here's where they graduated. Here's where they are, and this yeah. is some background about them. If that's helpful, you can do that. Um, this is very I, helpful, Steve. This is yeah. very helpful. I can send that link to you. You're mm -hmm. not required to do that, yeah. um, but you can also provide that kind of information. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yes, um, I was I was just wondering, like, if it makes more sense if we're in an area. Uh, like you were speaking about counseling over only having about 300. That's the way social studies education is. Uh, there's, there's not a ton of us. Um, and so it, does that seem like it, like giving a little bit extra information would probably be useful if there's not as many of us. Yeah. And it is, it goes, that letter is really going, your list is going to your chair. So to the extent that your chair understands your area, then it may not be as um, beneficial because they already understand. So if, so if Dr. Nichols 
was a social studies educator, then you're thinking, well, she already knows. But if it's somebody that's not, she mm -hmm. may not be quite as aware as that there's not the same depth and breadth. Mm -hmm. So there, there may be, you know, like school counseling faculty, might be fewer school counseling faculty, fewer rehab counseling faculty, a whole lot more clinical mental health counseling faculty. So um, in those areas where it's smaller, you might be able to speak to that. I think, you know, 288 faculty that teach comes to mind to me for rehabilitation counseling. It's not um, a really big specialty area. So anything you can do to provide some kind of basis. Now, will that be a make or break decision? Not necessarily, but you've provided it. And it might give the chair, if they're unable to get somebody to provide that information, some information that they can use to provide an explanation. Mm -hmm. We contacted 16 faculty to be an external reviewer and all said they were too busy or they're retiring or with the pandemic, they just aren't interested in doing that. It's too much. And all those things have actually come back. It's just too much. It's, I'm just struggling to do the basics. I can't do anything more or anything additional. That's the kind of responses we have had. And then every once in a while, there are a number of people that will do them. So you just, um, it just really is a matter of asking, but providing any information that you can to make it easier to explain why there may not be that depth mm -hmm. and breadth mm -hmm. might help. Not required. It's, those are something that you can do. Again, you'd provide that list of people. You don't have to use that form, but you can. Mm -hmm. You would provide that list by April 1st to your chair. Mm -hmm. And you have to make sure that your chair knows that you intend to apply um, mm -hmm. for promotion or for tenure and promotion at that time. At this point right now, there are only two people in the college that are required to go for tenure and promotion. So anybody else is going up on a, would be going up more voluntarily. Like promotion, you're never required to apply for promotion to full. Um, but you can, and you can do that at any time. Again, there's this, like I said, the hidden unwritten tenure rule mm -hmm. that depending upon the level of work that you've done may or may not be applied. Mm -hmm. Any other questions at all? I'm here to answer any questions that you do have, even if it's not today. And even when you're doing your electronic dossier, let's say it's in May or June, I'm, I'm, I'm never off contract. So I'm always available to answer and try and get you an answer to questions. If you have a question, email me first before you email the provost's office. If you email the provost's office, they're gonna refer it back to Dean Hill Clark, who's gonna refer it back to me anyway. Um, or they're gonna, if it goes to Amy, then Amy's gonna send it back to me anyway. So just please just email me first and I will try and help you get an answer. Sometimes it's something that can be done. There have been some problems with access that have been technical where Rob or Charlotte have been able to intervene. Sometimes it's something different, but I can at least help figure that out. Even if you aren't sure if you're loading it correctly, I'm more than happy to help you figure out if you are. Well, thank you. If you do have any questions, again, ask at any time. I'll send out a um, copy of the slides. This will be recorded. And so all my, all my stumbling will show up on recording. I wish they could edit that. But I will send out the copy of the slides for you. The links do work on the slides. And I'll send out copies of additional documents or links that so you're able to access that um, information or just the Word documents so you have them so you know what what you might want to use. It's really good seeing everybody. Um, I am on campus. Usually I'm on campus Tuesdays and Wednesdays. Tuesdays I teach, Wednesdays I teach. I'm normally right now I've been going over to Patterson Hall. So um, tomorrow I'll be on campus all day. So if you ever need to stop in or if you want to stop in, see somebody in person, I am in Patterson 119 um, or in Robeson Hall, depending upon the day, if I have to make space. So. Thank you very much. Um, and I'll send all this out to you right now before I forget. It's good seeing you. Have a good rest of your day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.